Hello, everybody. Turn this up in my headphones, Charles. Turn it up. Hello, everyone, one and all. Welcome back to another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles. I'll be your co-host today. And with me, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend here, Charles. Let's talk some fantasy, man. Today's an exciting day. We are continuing our discussion of the Poppy War series with The Dragon Republic by R.F. Kuang. Yeah, I'm in. Y'all know how uh, passionate I am about the Poppy War series and finally getting the chance over here to, I mean, I just finished the Dragon Republic today and really enjoyed it. And I'm pumped, Charles. I'm pumped to get into a conversation about this awesome novel. Yeah, I'm super excited to jump into it too. This is one of the first occasion. This is the first series that we both are reading for the first time and this is the first time we're actually talking about this book, which is uh which is very exciting. We have that new book energy going on. Curious to see what your thoughts are on this book. Mhm. Still has that new book smell, Charles. That's right. So I guess um, I'll just give a quick introduction of the Dragon Republic, and then we'll jump right into our discussion. Let's do it. All right. The epic, militaristic, grimdark, 20th century China-inspired Poppy War series continues with book two, The Dragon Republic by R.F. Kuang. The third battle of the Poppy War has just ended, and though Shaman Rin struggles with PTSD guilt, drug addiction, etc., she refuses to give in until she avenges the... Her, well, wait, she doesn't avenge the Empress. She gets her revenge against the treacherous Empress who betrayed Rin's homeland to its enemies. Her only hope is to join forces with the powerful dragon warlord who plots to conquer Nakan, unseat the Empress, and create a new republic. I had written... For some reason, I wrote, she avenges the treacherous empress. I was like, that's not right. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe you're trying to say avenges Alton. Alton, the psych, herself, I guess. like Because the empress betrayed um, her and her peoples. And even from the previous poppy wars, the empress has betrayed her people. So she's just coming at it she's just hungry for revenge at the beginning of this book and that's where the poppy war book one had left us yeah and in case you didn't already know oh (laughs) these buddy read discussion episodes are full of spoilers of the book that we are reading right now meaning Mm -hmm. the dragon republic for this episode so if you haven't yet read it then we recommend checking out one of our other awesome spoiler-free episodes. If you haven't read the Poppy War series at all, you can check out. <laughs> and our we also recommend we read reading the Poppy War, the Poppy War so, series yes. as well. So just for know sure. that it was good. Thank you for listening. And to avoid spoilers, you may want to check out right now and, and, and come back. But definitely read it. Yep. All right. So when we start the Dragon Republic, we are introduced to... Rin and Rin has just um, committed a mass genocide of a people. Basically, she used the power of the phoenix at the end of the Poppy War to eliminate the the enemy. Basically, she dropped the representation of a nuclear bomb on a whole country, thus ending the Poppy War. And what we see now is uh, Rin. She's commanding the psych, but she's also um, really struggling at these moments you know she she's waking up and every time she wakes up she has to check to make sure she's not chained and and shackled and she's become addicted to opiates and she's basically kind of shying away from her responsibilities as the leader of the psych and she's really just trying to hang on the only thing kind of keeping her going is her is her plot to assassinate the empress yeah, it's 
interesting seeing Rin, someone who we gave so much credit for being so proactive in our previous episode on this book, in our The Poppy War buddy read, mm-hmm. uh, where she will just do whatever it takes and she's very much just constantly making moves and try to be in control of things and then rightfully so after committing such an atrocity she's in a totally different place now and seeing how much she's struggling with it i think really helps drive home the point that kwong is getting at here or at least what i think kwong is getting at here which is how horrible an atrocity it was what rin did and that she has a person who does have feelings, whether she uh, likes to admit it sometimes or not, is really, really struggling with the guilt here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's a great way to kind of start her character arc by putting her at, this is close to her rock bottom, essentially. She's She's in the thick of her drug addiction, and that's really kind of capacitated her. And she's... At she's still fresh off of a lot of guilt from basically the war crimes that she's committed, and she's still like she's still kind of serving under the pirate the pirate lord. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Mong M O A G Moag. I don't know, <laughs> but the pirate queen basically, and she's just kind of going through the motions right now. She's thinking about Alton. She's thinking about um, the Empress. And, and she's just kind of going through the motions here. So we know Rin's character arc through this whole book is eventually she gains uh, her independence and belief in herself almost. So it, it, it's calculated by Kwong that we start in the beginning with her totally just out of it. Yeah, it's, I think, a really good place to go for Kwong in terms of being able to tell another story after covering so much in the Poppy War, because we spoke about in our last episode many times, I think, how Kwong covers a trilogy's worth of (laughs) events extremely well in the first book, and it probably could have been a standalone, and I would guess that it was kind of written to be a, you know, could be a standalone, but with sequel potential. Right. And because it's been such a hit, people are demanding more and more. And I was wondering, hey, how how can we, where can we go from here right. when this is about war with a country that Rin just blew off the face of the map right. and it it starts i think where it needs to and that's with rin struggling with the ramifications of what she's done and the only thing really on her mind that's anything of an objective is trying to kill the empress and right if she she basically says at points if she didn't have that she wouldn't want to be alive anymore at the start of this book. That's right. And there's a really good quote towards the beginning of this book that will I would I wanted to say so that we can compare it to a quote that she says at the end. But right here in the beginning she says the line, um, she didn't care about anyone's vision for the future. She stopped wanting to be great to carve out her place in history a long time ago, since she'd learned the cost. So that's kinda describes her headspace at the beginning of this book where she's like you know what i'm tired of trying to fight these other people's wars i don't really have a sense of nationalism i don't really have a family i don't really have anywhere to go home to at this point i just want to get revenge on the person that caused me so much misery and that's kind of the driving force of the beginning of this book and that's what causes her to eventually uh, join forces with uh, the dragon warlord, Vaisra. Yeah. I, I'm i wondering, Charles, what was it like for you reading Rin in such a, such a rough place, uh, such a different version of Rin than what we got in the first book? 
I appreciated it. You know, I I think Kwong did a good job of writing in the facet of her personality. Like, look, we all have ups and downs. We all go through phases and moments. And especially when you're addicted to something as addictive and crippling as like heroin, essentially. And I think Kwong is doing a good job of writing this kind of rock bottom moment. And also because I felt this reading Rin's story in the beginning in in the poppy war, I was like, what is she even putting herself through all of this for? Like, if I was as powerful as her, I'd just post up in a hut somewhere and and just stay away from all the drama and the horrible gore and violence and, like, everyone's getting her down. And that was kind of me going into this. So to see that she is also kind of burned out on that as well, it's like, I've seen enough violence for one lifetime. I, I... Really, at this point, all I want to do is kill the Empress. So I I liked it. I think it's a good place to start for this book. And I think, you know, uh, Kwong makes a very distinct point of ending this book on, like, the totally flip side. So I, I appreciated it. Yeah, you're a very different person than Rin, Charles. <laughs> so you're – I would just go to a hut. It's very <laughs> – <laughs> it's a very different choice than what Rin ends up making. I think that it is interesting to stop and think about what what Rin puts herself through, everything she puts herself through for. And the thing I kept seeing pop up was this stuff about identity and finding some sense of her own significance or mattering right and uh, there's lines throughout there's one this this is kind of near the end but just to stay on this topic of why is Rin do what she does uh, where she says she was also jealous that uh, this is she was also jealous that Neja's entire identity did not hinge on his shamanic abilities that's one right. where uh, and she's also got these lines like toward the end where she says uh, I'm supposed to be a soldier Rin shouted what the F am I supposed to do now and uh, the words written out there I just can't <laughs> say it on our uh, clean podcast but right. uh, throughout she just kind of has this piece where uh, as touch on the poppy war as well if she wasn't a soldier if she wasn't a shaman then she feels like she's nothing Right. Um, That's a good point. And you also made a good point of how she is con like part of her character is that she's drawn to power and she's drawn to people in power. And one of her personality traits is she just seeks approval from people that uh, have more yeah. power than she does. So I think that's another reason why she doesn't just post up in a hut somewhere is because she idolizes this idea of having power and using power and that's constantly weaved into this and i also think she's just a violent person as well as much as she suffers um from the stress of war and the aftermath of it she also uh, revels in in wielding that power and and wants to be around people that are powerful as well and she finds home and with the rest of the psych who are also fellow shamans and things like that and we know from her talks with Neza which again we're skipping forward about her <laughs> philosophy on shamanic abilities and using them and things like that so I get it like those are all have been woven into her, her personality from the start of her desire to be smarter than everyone else stronger than everyone else and also her desire to serve and learn from those around her that have these leadership roles well said, Charles. And that's mm. such an interesting piece of Rin's character that makes her so well-rounded is that part of w consistently throughout this series so far, wanting the approval and validation from these authority figures mm -hmm. in her life that she admires and respects. It ranges back to Master Irja at the Academy. and Even her uh, tutor, Phelan, at the very beginning. Tutor, Phelan. I think uh, then, of course, that comes up constantly throughout this book with um, 
uh, Visera. Yes, as... she idolizes him so much. Yeah. And she even can't shake the ghost of Alton as well. It, it comes in so True. much throughout this. And I always, like, even most of the way through Dragon Republic, saw this character trait. I was like, so bizarre that someone who, even at the very beginning with, like, um, pi- the Pirate Queen's, like, um, her sort of pirate government, she just is like, get out of my way. I don't, like, I need to speak to the Pirate Queen. It's like, oh, she's unavailable. It's like, I don't care. Get out of my way. She's like, no one touches me. I'm like, I will kill you. <laughs> you know, she, like, doesn't back down when people try and block her path, yet she also is obsessed with seeking these people's approval. And one of my favorite parts of this book, particularly The Dragon Republic, is this whole book is essentially how she kind of shakes that off and gets herself away from that personality trait and is like, you know what, I don't need to seek approval from anyone because I am that person now. And so I think this whole book gets from that point of just, uh, I don't want to live anymore, I'm trying to seek revenge, i drawn to this dragon warlord too. I can be my own warlord, essentially. So that whole character trait that she has, this this book is basically the 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 char- her character arc in this book is changing and shaking that off, which was I liked to see. I was very happy with her character arc by the end. That's a great point, Charles. I was grappling with some of that as a as a theme of the first two books, right? I, we're jumping way ahead and maybe maybe this podcast just won't go the way of jumping from plot point to <laughs> plot point. We'll see what ends up happening here. Uh, but uh, the the book pretty much ends with this piece about autonomy, right? There's this quote toward the end. Uh, she had thought that being a weapon might give her peace, that it might place the blame of blood-soaked decisions on someone else so that she was not responsible for the deaths at her hands. But all that had done was make her blind, stupid, and so easily manipulated. And it goes on to say, she was finished taking orders. Whatever she did next would be her sole autonomous choice. Right. And I'm, I'm wondering, Charles, I, I know she was following Alton a lot in the first book. Mm-hmm. But it does feel like she, push comes to shove, ends up making her own decisions uh, in that first book. And it almost feels like, though she won validation and all this kind of stuff, uh, that she... uh, I was kind of interpreting at first as like the first book, she (laughs) learns that just pursuing what you want at any cost has, well, costs. (laughs) Lots of costs that are really hard. And then in the second book, she learns, well, you can't go the complete opposite way and just be someone's weapon, as she says here, Uh, because then you don't even get to (laughs) choose your own misery, which is kind of grabbing from the a line in the the Poppy War, the first book, where she says, well, at least it was a misery. She chose it. You actually just end up being manipulated by other people who are willing yeah. to be Machiavellian in the way that Rin often was in that first book. Right. So, Charles, do you see it as the two books progressed her like in a straight line toward this point where she's overcome it? Or do you see it more like how I was seeing it of like the first book she learns the lesson of you can't go all in uh, on just your own stuff and then the second uh, book she learns that you can't just be someone else's weapon either. I would agree with that. I th- I would add another kind of nuanced layer to it. For me, Kwong does a really interesting job with Rin's character, right, of splitting the difference between, like, self-confidence and then also this idea of accepting responsibility. I think f- it, most cases they go hand in hand, but Rin's case was unique in that she always had self-confidence and she's not afraid to stand up to authority and by the end of the poppy war she was able to make choices for herself and and go in her own direction and pursue um, her own uh, kind of quest for power like you were saying but she was still having an issue with 
responsibility. She felt like it was kind of everyone for themselves kind of thing. She never felt like she could lead people. She was still getting bossed around. Like in the beginning, she's getting bossed around by the pirate queen. And the pirate queen just is like, everyone around her is like, you know, she's just going to like kill you. <laughs> and she just, and right away, the, the, the first opportunity, the pirate queen is like attacks her and would have killed her if the, um, if the dragon warlord didn't step in. So I think this whole idea of her, her mentality as a soldier and as a follower is the huge thing she had to overcome in, in dragon Republic because she wields the, like a power that would make her strong enough to be someone in power, but it took her so long and she had to go through like fight for everyone else before she um, decided she was going to fight for herself. And also, take the leadership role which like she was the commander of the psych but she wasn't good at it and she even admits many times that she never like felt like she did anything right and she has those she has these talks with everyone about how she failed them and she was too busy getting high to be a, a effective leader and all that but by the end she becomes a confident ruler and for me that's that distinction that individual self-confidence versus that accept of responsibility and that's kind of how i see her these two books play out that's yeah that actually it really helps clarify things <laughs> for me charles that's a great way to think about it. i appreciate you saying all that because mm -hmm. it was this piece where she was never afraid to make her own decisions on her own behalf mm -hmm. in the first book right she just if anything she could probably use a little bit more uh <laughs> gratification delay skills yeah. right she's right. very impulsive but she'd make decisions and just be like i'm gonna suffer whatever consequences come when i make these decisions but she never had that uh, she never wanted to be a leader where other people would have to deal with the consequences of her decisions right and this book helped her get to the point where by the end she's like no i need to be a general i need to be someone in charge and there is a difference between that and just your own hey i'll make choices for myself and right. even yeah and even when kinda... she was making those choices right when she dropped that bomb on the enemy like she saw that as a uh a choice she made for herself. Like I took the power of the Phoenix and I ended the war. But then this, in this book, she's dealing with the responsibility of that, that she had been trying to ignore of like, well, I did, you know, kill a lot of innocent people as well. We're still, it didn't really solve anything. We're still fighting. And, you know, the psych is now wanted war criminals. So she's, even when she was acting in self-confidence, she's still now learning to accept the responsibility of it. Same thing with Alton, right? Because she's fighting the ghost of Alton, like literally multiple times throughout the first three quarters of this book. And I, I, I think that's her also accepting responsibility as um, someone who was fighting with the psych and is who's taken over command. And Alton was the one before her, and she just has to embrace that. So that was kind of how I saw her character going uh, throughout this whole series. And it's interesting to see how all of these figures that she's following, from the Pirate Queen to Alton to the Dragon Warlord, have treat to the Empress, and how they all treat her. It's all the same. And it takes all of that betrayal to finally get her to, to stand up. So that whole character trait of her respecting people in power because she didn't want to take on authority comes to a head when that, with these final betrayals and she's like, you know what? Like I have all this power. It's time for me to, to do something with it. And that's how we end dragon Republic, which I really enjoyed. That makes sense, Charles. I enjoyed that too. And I think that it's, it's cool to see throughout as she learns lessons like, hey, I don't have to, I can be a leader without being literally Alton. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, just down to when she's using the trident yeah. and people keep telling her, 
why are you using this thing? <laughs> and we as readers are probably thinking the same thing. Why are you using the trident? Yeah. Just use a sword. Yeah. And she's always used swords before. And then she goes and decides to get the trident melted down. That was a great moment. Has, yeah. She has every opportunity not to because the the smith, I guess it is, who she goes to to get done keeps being like, Hey, you know, this is kind of one of a kind. You're never going to get this back. Are you sure? Positive, all this kind of stuff. And she's like, yes, I am sure. Because it's not about a weapon anymore. It's about saying, I'm going to be my own person as a leader. And this was after she broke the seal, right? So Mm -hmm. breaking the seal, like the metaphor of her literally putting Alton behind her and kind of getting over him. And uh, it was only after she did that that she was ready to forge her own weapon which (laughs) another metaphor for how her character arc played out by the true end of the book so something that's interesting charles with the whole breaking the seal thing that whole alton fever dream situation Mm -hmm. that she's going through when they're trying to break the seal that doesn't really work uh, so much as the binding her to kitai uh, as what is helpful for making this all work and getting her fire back. And it's interesting. I'm not sure if we've seen it all come to fruition there or if it really will, but there's something too, maybe that when she's really able to move on is when she actually quite literally starts to rely on in every possible by binding with Kite, the, like the only person who has actually just been a consistent, supportive, grounding presence in her life. Right. Where all these other people she's tried to rely on, they have like these uh, second sides to them that are usually abusive to her. Right. And finally, she's aligning herself by the end, mostly with people who have just always, or at least with uh, Kite. I can't say his name. I'm not sure how. How do you say that one, Charles? Kite. 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 I say Kite. But Kite. Okay. Yeah. I'll say Kite just because I, I said it a couple different ways. I just got to sell on one so people know what I'm talking about. Kite is someone who's just been a good friend. Right. And <laughs> no, I now think she's I, with him. You you touched on something uh, really crucial there for for Vin. That's. Not so explicitly stated. Rin. Uh, Rin. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I say Vin? <laughs> yeah. I'm going back to... Uh, shout out to Mistborn. Yeah, shout out to Mistborn, Brandon Sanderson. It, it's uh, a hard one. Yeah. Rin. Uh, you, you, Because Vin also had uh, trust issues and didn't, yeah. have a, didn't have a home, didn't have a good sense of family. So it's an interesting comparison here because the point I wanted to make was that you touched on that moment and you made a, you made a good observation in that... Um, one of Rin's biggest issues and why she's been struggling so much to this point is because she has no home or identity or family and no one to trust. Anyone she's ever tried to serve under has um, betrayed her in a way. And she's desperately looking for um, a connection. And I think while Kite, and it takes like in this world of fantasy it takes a a magic rule where you are literally binding two people together through magic and and entwining their destinies to earn that kind of anchorage and that kind of trust and i think you said it great when you said that kate is her anchor and that's really what got her out of this funk with alton and really got her to embrace more of a leadership role when she got to can, like bind herself to Kate. It's like, okay, now Kate is someone I can trust because he's not going to betray me because if he kills me, he dies. So it's like, I can trust him. And she always felt that way anyway, but now it's like official, right? They're binded together. So once they were like, there's the scenes right after they were binded that they're in the boat and they're getting a sense of her powers and Kate's causing Rin to think about her powers in a different way as a tool that can be measured and honed and and the possibilities of it are endless she they can they use flying machines and the the fire is like fueling the flying machine and and um all these things that she really caused her to 
gain confidence and gain, you know, strength and not in the way of like being able to burn things. She's always had that strength, but the strength in herself and in her community, which she's starting to build here with this binding of Kate. I think you were right on when you, that's a huge critical moment for Rin. Super interesting. Right. And for someone who struggles so much with self-worth, like Rin does throughout these first couple books, it makes sense why she, she almost doesn't see herself as deserving of someone like Kite in her life. And Mm -hmm. there's almost this tension to that where she throws herself all in. She'll do anything that, uh, Vaistra or Alton, people who literally hit her and yeah. things like that. Uh, um, she'll do whatever they say, but she's arguing with Kite all the time. Yeah, and she gets mad at him books. too. It's like, yeah. why are you letting me do this? It's obviously hurting you. And he's like, I'm fine. Like, just keep mm-hmm. training. So it was interesting. You're right. <laughs> but, and just that she'll, she'll argue with him about, uh, like, basically everything. I think she even says that when they're getting binded together she's like uh, we're very different we fight about everything when she's talking to Kara about how she feels like her and Chagan are very very similar Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it's interesting that (laughs) Rin pushes back against the one person who treats her well and she's very uh, she's easily weaponized by people who treat her the way which she probably thinks she's deserving of being treated which is uh, as if she's uh, she says in this book like a dog or, or something right more worthless than a person so i'm interested to see now that it seems like she's start to get more belief in herself as a leader and maybe more self-worth we'll see where that starts to take us in the burning god when that comes out I'm interested to see where it goes. It, it feels like with R.F. Kuang's writing, with which gets labeled as grimdark sometimes, yeah. it feels like it, things are not going to necessarily end happy. But I am interested to see where Rin's arc ends up and if, if this ends up being a, a good change for her. It feels like it should be a good change, but with someone as ruthless as her, we'll see. Right. I mean, she said some pretty alarming things at the mm-hmm. end, uh, which makes you think, like, you know, she's going to be a great ruler, but she's also not going to be uh, someone that you might like. She might be someone you're terrified of. She, you know, she's basically... I, you know, she's like basically Vicera, but serving herself. You know, she's become that type of person. So it will be definitely interesting to see how that plays out in the third and, and final book because she's built up to the point now where she has that confidence. She's accepted that responsibility. And she's there's a quote where she's like, this is basically a numbers game, and I've got tons of lives to spare <laughs> because there's tons of people I can throw at them, and I yeah. will throw them at them over and over again, however many lives it takes to beat them, which is kind of an alarming thing to hear where it's sure. like I will march thousands of people against the, you know, the the war machines of the West, you know, the Hesperians, where it's like, I will just throw bodies and bodies and bodies at you until eventually we destroy your superior technology. It's like, that's going to take a lot of lives. (laughs) And she's more than willing to spend it at this point. So it will be interesting to see how she balances that ruthlessness with her, with her responsibility. For sure. I mean, the, the book does end with her, her and the phoenix basically in total agreement for the first time (laughs) maybe since she uh, i would say they were probably in total agreement at the end of the first book when she does the uh destroys musion right but yeah there's a together uh spoke the phoenix we will burn down this world and you never want to be on the same page as the the phoenix Uh, yeah so yeah, probably not going to go in a happy direction. <laughs> right. Here. We're happy that Rin has her confidence, but also she's confident in going to war and um, causing lots of people to die, which will be an interesting 
dynamic to see where it's like what is the cost of having confidence and believing in yourself so much that you're willing to make decisions that affect thousands of lives you know so what kind of sociopath do you have to be to command an army like that i don't know like we'll see Kwong does such an interesting job of of balancing what feels like very real character growth with someone potentially becoming a worse person. Yeah, it feels like she's so been doing true. that throughout. Yeah. Where we were just talking about Vin and Brandon Sanderson's work and Sanderson's work. I won't spoil anything, but it's so much more hopeful. Yeah. And it's like when characters, at least, are our protagonists in a Sanderson work, when they go through character growth, that is synonymous with becoming better people, essentially. Right. And in Kwong's work, uh, uh, I don't know. It's oftentimes becoming worse people <laughs> while be while growing through your own insecurities <laughs> that's so, so you true don't see a lot of that's this. a brilliant observation because you you see people in power you see like famous war generals or or presidents or emperors or things and it's like when you learn about the stuff they've done it's not great it, you know and it's uh i think kuang really taps into that with rin it's like she's her character growth has been tremendous, especially in Dragon Republic, where now she's fully embraced her readership role. We're happy for her. She's no longer the pawn of all these horrible people. But now she's essentially become one of those horrible yeah. people. She's going to have to spend thousands of lives in a bloody war. She's trying to do the same thing that Vice was trying to do for the Republic and and the Queen is uh, Do- the Empress Daji is trying to do for the Empire. And it's like she's basically on the same level as them now. So how is she going to be any different? She's, you know, that's a really great observation. It's like she, her character growth was tremendous, but now she's much more dangerous and she's much more, uh, has much more potential for destruction, which we know is a huge part of this book, that power at a cost kind of thing. So we'll see how it goes. For sure. Charles. Well, I'm glad we, <laughs> I'm glad we got to have a lot of discussion about Rin and her arc because I think that that is the core. That's of what these book. books are. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. I mean, sure, it is military fantasy, and there's a ton there with the tactics and the fighting that's going on. Yeah, the boat at least for me. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, the naval battles and whatnot. But for me, the this series is about. It's about Rin and her transformation and journey throughout and For sure. to be able to really give it the time to speak about that directly rather than only plot points, I think, is it serves right. us well here. Yeah. But I do want to see, unless you do have more no, there, Charles. No, I, I was agreeing with you completely. I think for me, the selling point of the series is one, the setting, but two, the character of Rin. And, and I think you'd hit the nail on the head with this idea of character growth versus like embrace like being a good person (laughs) is a super interesting one and the idea of like kuang taking two different attributes that we normally take side by side like Mm -hmm. self-confidence and responsibility and character growth and being a good person and she completely splits them and puts them in totally opposite ends of rin's character and that's what makes rin so interesting to read so 100 percent agree but i'm ready to hit some plot points is like you want to is there one earlier on we should go back to uh well we pretty much just got to the point where the psych joined visor's army way at the beginning there right i think honestly we've hit on probably what we need to from that right like right it's just interesting to see okay the pirate queen betrayed her Mm -hmm. and now she's going to uh join vicera and so this is the beginning of a long series of betrayals and so that's just something worth pointing out but yeah we we the plot moves on and she joins the republic and um her power gets sealed is there anything you wanted to Talk about up to that point where she encounters Daji again and her power. Daji pretty directly tells Rin all the things that she'll tell Rin again at the end of the book, but Rin's finally ready to actually hear it. And I think we as the readers are too. 
I really like how Kwong is able to... It just feels like Kwong does this really good job of, of subverting some of these things like Daji is the evil person trying to tell Rin why she actually is a hero of her own story and who Rin is with is the bad guy in her story, so you should join me. And villains do that all the time right. in books, right? Mm -hmm. And Daji does that here, and we kind of just take it for that, or I did kind of just take it for that face value. I did know Visor's not a great guy, but I was kind of like thinking the Republic is better than Daji from what we've seen from Daji anyway. Right. And that Rin was kind of on the lesser of two evils. And then to have <laughs> basically a circle back to, hey, Rin should have listened to the who we thought the villain was the first time right. is, is really interesting and, and not something I feel like I've seen before. Well, yeah, and it's not so much listen to because I think Rin made the wise choice of not listening to either one of them at that mm -hmm. point but she did like because at, in the beginning we didn't know things about Vaisra, right that he was he kind of let the third poppy war happen and he embraced it and he withheld support to strengthen his own position to start a civil war right so those things we didn't know we didn't know how at the mercy of the Hesperians he was willing to be and how he was going to use Rin and all of her psych shaman uh brethren as pawns to trade with the Hesperians and, and so now she's at the eve of this battle and the Hesperian fleet have washed up at the end of this book right and they finally come to give their support Daji, Daji now that she's been defeated is like well hello don't you see what's happening here like you should have listened to me from the beginning this kind of stuff is happening and Rin lets her go mostly probably because Daji still has her powers to being able to compulse people to do things, but also maybe in part that she wasn't ready to fully write off what she had to say at that point either. So yeah, it's interesting how that same message from the beginning to the end kind of holds true, but Rin kind of treats it differently. Yeah. It's a great point to bring up. Yeah. The message doesn't change, but Rin does, right. which is, and the fact that it feels natural both times is such a testament to yeah. Kwong's character writing of Rin. Absolutely. And yeah, Rin gets a little bit more of the background uh, from Daji in the second time, but it's, it's the same message that Baisra is or basically he, Daji is trying to say that Baisra is the lesser of two evils and Baisra tr tries to pitch it the other way. And Charles, I was very uh, witcher of you to <laughs> he responded to my hey maybe she should have listened to Daji with <laughs> that she shouldn't have listened to either of them yeah. to go yeah I was saying yeah. the lesser of two evils and you were saying that uh you'd rather her not choose at all right yeah. Charles? <laughs> right right <laughs> right exactly and that for me was a huge part of this book that I enjoyed was that she did finally make that decision um a hundred percent. And we've gotten tons of warnings about Vaisra throughout this yeah. whole book. And it's like Rin didn't pick up on any of it. It, it, it draw, And I'm kind of on the fence about that. Like how many times do we have to have that foreshadowing that Vaisra is bad? And there's one good line that justifies a lot of it which where she said where in the book she mentions all she knew was that it felt good to be a part of Viser's army to act on Viser's orders to be Viser's weapon and tool if she wasn't making the decisions then nothing could be her fault so that is kind of her justification for entering the army that and her just attraction to Viser as a leader and his commanding presence and he's willing to take her under his wing a little bit so that also that sense of belonging kind of pulls her in and her need for approval at the beginning of the book we talked about her arc she's still at the beginning at this point so she's still seeking that approval so and she's still shirking responsibility so all that together kind of justifies how she stuck along for the ride as long as she did it it, it pulls her in there so i think it makes total sense charles i mean this is someone who's committed single-handedly in Rin committed 
genocide Mm -hmm. and for her to seek a way to basically act on what I see as like violent impulses and maintenance of her own identity in terms of being a soldier Mm -hmm. for her to seek a way to have those things while having minimal fault. Right. It makes total sense from someone who has, who's at fault for probably the worst thing that anyone, at least living in Rin's world has ever done. Right. And also she was kind of forced into joining him, right? Because it's like, well, I could just let the pirate queen kill you. Or now that I have you, I could kill you myself. So you really have no choice but to join. So I get that she, like, you know, Vice is clearly showing himself to be a good negotiator, manipulator, leader in these moments. This kind of militaristic aspect of the Poppy War kind of plays in here. And uh, so she kind of, although she chose to join, she also kind of didn't really have an option at this point. So um, that was interesting as well. Um, yeah, so that's her joining the army. Uh, joining the Republic. Well, she also joins because of Neja. Right. Who, I mean, oh, it's Neja. clear to <laughs> it's clear to everyone but Rin <laughs> at this point that she has some feelings for Neja, and mm-hmm. I think obviously that's playing some sort of role. And and she's asked at points like, "Hey, would you even be here if it weren't for him?" <laughs> and don't feel like she has a good answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Once she starts to gain the trust and going out campaigning as part of the Republic, she and she starts to have the opportunity to bail, she doesn't. And she actually even doubles down on this soldier role. She, um, by Jinza, Jinza basically demotes her and she kind of embraces that demotion. She's like, good, I just need to be told what to do right now because I really don't want that responsibility so instead of getting away while she could potentially or getting getting an even stronger influence within the republic she just falls further and further into that role of i'm a tool i'm a soldier just tell me where i need to go what i need to do so i don't have to think about the weight of the decisions that i'm making i'm just following orders and that she brings it really down to the way she's literally like a foot soldier in the army. Exactly. And it was interesting seeing that happen just because, I don't know, another thing that we don't get a lot of in, in fantasy is someone who's literally just a foot soldier. Mm-hmm. It feels like we usually get people a little higher up, right? We get royalty and things like that as point of view characters. So to see Rin just in the thick of things, just being a, uh, a a grunt, if you will, is, right. even though, of course, she has a lot of skills from her time in the military academy, but she doesn't have powers at this point, or at least she can't access them at this point because of the seal. For sure. So she's fighting as a foot shoulder, foot soldier, and nailed uh, it. Nailed it. <laughs> and the, uh, the river gets poisoned at the Dragon Republic capital. So they go to war on this huge naval campaign. This is where we get a lot of militaristic um, set pieces. We get all the different kinds of ships, like the warships versus the um, sleeker navigating ships and things like that, definitely earning that militaristic (laughs) adjective in the description of the series. And that was fun to read. They're kind of blowing their way through. They have the superior naval force at this point. They meet little resistance. Um, they're on their way up to the capital. Um, they have a run-in with an old classmate. I don't want to put us on the spot. Do you remember the name of that classmate from Synagard? She was a woman. And uh, is it with an yeah? It's with, with an N or something. Yeah, like something. And um, they. I'll look it up while you're talking. Thank to you. Her. So I'll just kind of set the scene here. So they're kind of following the river, right? Uh, Kate has discovered that um, they're using like pig bladders and filling them with poison and by the time the bladder disintegrates it's already far enough downstream that it only affects the south and not the north so it's a way of kind of getting the poison down south and they trace it back to basically the center of the 
the source of the uh, the poison. Did you find the name? Yeah, it's it is Nyang. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying it like pronouncing it correctly, but N I A N G. And that was an interesting moment. Um, so it's Kate and Rin, and then they run into Nyang, and they have a little back and forth. They're on opposite sides of this war. And I think this is the first time it's like, wow, we are at war with a classmate. Like, Kate, didn't you have a crush on her or something? It's like, that was before she poisoned the well, you know? <laughs> Which was an interesting Fair. little side side moment there. I think that that's something that Kwong does extremely well, too, is she's great at using the... Uh, basically, the pieces that she has are... Uh, let's say, on the chessboard, if you will, uh, where she sees, oh, well, I need this moment to hit harder here where they find the wells poisoned and stuff like that. So she's like, oh, well, I'll just take someone from the academy and move them there. And that doubles up the impact of this because you get to have Kite kill a classmate. Yeah, Which and that is. was a great moment where this, where it's that kind of directness where I think the actual line is F this and you know they say the whole thing and goes it's, it's <laughs> grim dark fantasy. He's like F this and just shoots her like mid sentence, you know, which I was like, Thank you, like let's move this along. And it's also kind of a turning point for Kate. Kate has been so shaken by all of this mm-hmm. wartime violence and you you start to get a little concerned for him. He's starting to get a little more callous, a little more disassociated with what's going on. And I think this was a turning point for him where he so directly took a life and he took the life of someone he grew up with and went to school with. It's also a great foreshadowing tool where they're like, wow, I didn't consider that we would be going to war against our classmates. You know, this idea of like, you know, not everyone's all buddy buddy anymore. So all of that together made a really interesting scene. Well said, Charles. I think the... The last piece that I would want mention around this part of the book would be around when Aracha, which is the character that can turn their body into water. That's oh, barrel, yeah, yeah, it gets poisoned, yeah. Yeah, so Aracha dies. Another, <laughs> another good use of the pieces that... Kwong has to work with where it's like okay I don't really have a place for Racha anymore and they're already poisoning the water so might as well have a character die right. and kind of caused Kwong I would bet knows that we are not probably overly attached to Racha we yeah. haven't seen that much of this character right uh she plays it so that Rin who are super tight the to the perspective of uh also is kind of like I didn't know Aracha that yeah. well and she just sees Aracha as this loss of a of a chess piece basically that right. she, Rin could be working with and I feel like that's it's pretty awesome because it could have been almost maudlin in the sense that uh, we are seeing a character die but we as the uh, readers maybe don't know them that well and sometimes authors will try to make us like feel things for characters yeah they might start writing in for. these moments yeah. all of a sudden you're like uh oh I have a bad feeling about this character yeah. <laughs> like why is all of a sudden we're getting this moment where the two where the main character and the side character share a little back and forth but no it's just like up oh, another chess piece gone that's unfortunate yeah and I feel like instead that becomes this moment which helps drive home how far gone Rin is. Right. Because Rin presumably does know Aracha a little better than we do. There was kind of a time skip between. And at that point, she was still kind of responsible for him as well. She hadn't been demoted yet. So Mm -hmm. Um. kind of seeing her take this loss in the way that we as readers are taking the loss because we don't know Aracha that well, I feel like makes us see how far gone Rin is. So Kwong just helps use this as character development for Rin rather than trying to make us just feel things about Aracha that we probably wouldn't have felt. For sure. And it wasn't long after that Haracha died that she lo- that she was demoted. Um, so it, another reason she's like, I'm not fit to rule these people. I don't even, to like yeah. command these people. I, don't even, I didn't even care about that guy. <laughs> so that was one of her many reasons for being at peace with losing command. And being a foot soldier up until um, 
uh, Jinza's fleet makes it pretty close to the Empire, and then they suffer that big defeat, and the Wind God returns and messes up their ships. The Empire was waiting for them. They had a fleet prepared. They basically blew them out of the water, and uh, that's quite literally. Quite literally, and that's what <laughs> gets us to um, the hinterlands and our introduction to the Keterids and the Naimeds, not hinterlanders. That is not a politically correct term for their uh, group of people because they're different tribes that happen to live in the hinterlands. It's not their identity, so just a little side piece there. Good on you, Charles. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting scene, especially from almost a world building perspective. It does. I feel like the hinterlands are mentioned multiple times before uh, all of this plays out. And you know that Chagan and Kara are from there, but it's kind of more of an I- idea than really anything that's fleshed out until we get to see some of their culture and actually get to see that they are probably the ones who best understand uh, the uh, pantheon and uh, the gods and how to interact with them and we get some background on uh, where the trifecta comes from right from them as well and that they were kind of unsavory characters themselves too which is interesting and that yeah, the like, dragon king might still be alive was also like a piece that they kind of played in that yeah it'll be interesting to see what does or doesn't develop from that because it's pretty open-ended right now. Mm -hmm. The thing they introduced was that, well, if you're bonded, you basically can't live without the other person being alive unless you die in the same exact place and do something to make sure only one of you leaves. And I kind of thought when this happened, I was like, Oh, kid a is screwed. (laughs) was kind of, but they actually went the route of, and maybe he is long-term. But uh, they went the route of showing it more through Chagan and Kara. Right. With having Kara uh, die. And uh, yeah, so when it comes to the, the, it's the dragon emperor is the, what's the right way to, dragon emperor. He is the dragon emperor, yeah. If you're you're talking about the trifecta member, yeah, he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So uh, there was the prophecy that said, like, one of you will die, one of you b- will be imprisoned in stone or whatever, and one of you will rule, I think, something like that. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. The, the the Dragon Emperor could just be dead. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. It feels maybe too easy. But if the Dragon Emperor died and Zhang and Sudaji were around during that, then he could have just gone and not taken them with him. That's true. Absolutely. We get um, removing the seal. We finally uh, part ways with Alton. I, for, I felt like for so long, I never felt that um, Rin and Alton had a romantic relationship. Kind of what I liked in the first book was that anytime someone tried to use Alton to sway her, it didn't work because they always assumed there was this romantic connection and there really wasn't. And that's how she kept being able to like thwart all these attempts on her to, for her to be influenced and then we finally get to the seal this fever dream and then she's finally able to just kill him in the dream and be able to remove the seal so for me i'm like okay great like we can be done with all to now good riddance kind of a thing like i'm i'm happy Ouch. that i'm happy that rin was able to finally get past that i mean I, I like the stuff with Alton, and I think we did talk about this in one of our two popular Buddy Reed discussion episodes, Charles, where I think I, when we're talking about when she killed that monster that took Alton's face, I can't right. remember the name of the monster right now, but I think I was thinking there might be a little bit more there, and you were thinking that <laughs> it was just that monster was <laughs> grasping at straws yeah. because Rin doesn't care about anyone. Right. But it's interesting. I said back then, right? Like, it's interesting that it chose Alton instead of Kite. Uh-huh. And where we know she cares about Kite and not in the way that she loves 
a romantic partner, but seems to love Kite, that the monster would choose Alton. And I've always thought, yeah, it, maybe it's more of an infatuation or right. Crush. Alton's always been romanticized, like a celebrity or something, exactly. whereas Kite was like her friend. So it, mm-hmm. it's different when it's Alton, right? The the poster child at the at Syngard and now the commander of the psych versus Kite who is of a noble birth and is super super smart but is also like kind of at her level I think that's True. a huge distinction yeah and All I right, think so that yeah they, they were pulling on that romantic uh, draw for a long time and uh, and maybe she did feel that kind of infatuation with him but I never got the sense that it was truly like a, a romance. And then finally no. Rin was able to to move past it by like <laughs> killing him, which I appreciated that as well. Um, we also get the sense here, Charles, that uh, something probably went down between Chagan and Alton romantically. Yes, yes we do earlier on. Together. Right, when, yeah. when Chagan was um, using... Rin's seal as a way to try and bring Alton back, right? Was under the pretense that he would be able to break the seal for her or guide her to the place to break the seal. He was just using her. Another good example of <laughs> of her being used for manipulation um, was in those moments. So, yeah, there was a potential relationship that was a little more romantic going on between the two of them, which explained a lot of Chagan's behavior up to this point. Yeah. Um, we know he's been particularly upset. And they, Alton was always the elephant in the room for the two of them. Like, that was kind of the trump card that ended the conversation for them, was when one of them brought up Alton, it was like a personal affront, and they just had to leave the room. So it, it does kind of put all that into new perspective, which makes it interesting. On the FTF podcast, we say the Oliphant. The Oliphant, <laughs> the Oliphant in, the in the room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right to our Lord of the Rings uh, buddy reads. Yeah, yeah yes. absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was the Oliphant in the room. And exactly. we also get the controversy between Sork and Syra versus Bector, her son. And Bector use, like, um, willingly releases the Hesperians knowing that there would be a skirmish and that he could kind of take over power from his mother, which was an interesting kind of military fantasy plot point that that developed from this and might have implications in the third book. But I thought it was interesting, another way of using the Hesperians as a a tool. And it seems like the Ketarids have a lot of knowledge about shamanism and the origins and the mysteries that we still need to figure out about the triads and things like that. So interesting to see how that played out. But some nobody with a gun can still kill yeah. him. And that's part of what's driven home. And we haven't talked much about the Hesperians or the way that they view the Nakara and... I, I liked that... how Rin viewed the Hesperians at first. Like when they introduced themselves, like, he's, she's like, that's a stupid name. It's just a garble of consonants. Yep. You can't even say that. And then she's like, oh, I, their white skin is weird. <laughs> so it was, it, or their, their creamy skin or something like that. It was interesting to see how someone who's been the victim of racism because of her skin tone and her name and the way she pronounces things kind of perceives this foreign entity. I thought it was... Um, an interesting kind of uh, dichotomy there of her personality, which I I got a laugh out of. It's interesting to see like that kind of Western fantasy group come in as the foreign group and how yeah. they're perceived kind of from this alien um, as these aliens, right? And you get this interpretation of, of how they're perceived on face value. I thought that was a really fun perspective that everyone had um, for the Hesperians, which basically represents European or American Western ideas. (laughs) Yeah, I was trying to figure out, because it feels like we get pretty direct parallels for China and Japan. I was trying to figure out, is Hesperia, is it like Britain? Is it just supposed to represent kind of like Western 
partners like uh, that could be the U.S. or could be. I get Britain, strong or, British or vibes because of the huge navy and this imperialism sense. mentality mm-hmm. and like guns. It seems like this is the early um, invention of the gun. It seems like guns are relatively new. Um, so for me, it's, and, it has an early uh, imperialism vibe. But who knows? It could be I, anything. Yeah, and arquebuses is, is a real word that. Is the word that they use for guns in this, I thought it was like a, like oh, it's interesting. She made up her own word for gun. No, I was familiar right. with the phrase. Yeah. Um, at least the I phrase like a, because those old school guns that are basically have the huge tubes as the, mm-hmm. as the firing end. You know, you kind of just dump the gunpowder in it and <laughs> it shoots like it's just a giant like a little hand cannon. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. No, I. I didn't know that word, so maybe I'm just out of the loop and most people know that, but I was like, ooh, it's interesting that she made her own You weren't paying guns. attention in AP European history, Dylan? <laughs> no, I guess I wasn't. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Haller. Yeah, our history our teacher. Our AP Euro, that was, she's my favorite teacher, so uh, <laughs> I think uh, got a shout out to Miss Haller. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was... Yeah, I'm a fan of the Hesperians. I think they're this nice, fo- and that's they were this. <laughs> You're a fan of them as a piece of this, right? Like okay. they're um, <laughs> this idea, like oh, they're coming, and then they're you know kind of with they're kind of this like looming force, right? That everyone's kind of warning her about. It's like you know, once they come in, they're just gonna do their own thing, and they don't care about you at all, right? And she kind of acknowledges that, and it's kind of put off for a while. So yeah, it's an interesting piece there. It is. And I, you do see Kwong drawing from her vast knowledge base of these matters by showing how the Hesperians come in and view oh, people in a, uh, Nikon as being like less than yeah. human yeah i mean just like try and trying to make kind of this half theology half science attempt at it that is just like we can see it from rin's perspectives and hopefully our perspectives as just like straightforward racism yeah but uh, to see how it's pitched in this way that like it's scientific was uh you know true to history and it's i think well done from kwong to depict that from rin's perspective i think uh, especially people are aren't super familiar with all that history might learn some stuff and for sure even people familiar with reading modern fantasy that's in like a swords and sorcery european kind of setting to see the narrative kind of flipped here to have like an Asian perspective looking out to seeing the Hesperians this what we're more used to with some of the more popular works of fantasy being the like alien invaders is an interesting um, use of perspective that I thought was really well done here well said Charles so they suffered that horrible defeat the seals broke in Kate and Ren are binded, which I think we did a good job of covering that. And there's this brief moment where they reunite with, uh, where Ren reunites with Auntie Fang and Kasigi. I don't have too much to say on that other than this kind of goes back to like, why didn't she just go to a hut? And, you know, it's like, you were trying to marry me off. It's like, yeah, and you would have lived a better life than any of us. Like, you know, I wasn't that bad to you that you had an out, you know, all you had to do was, uh, be uh be willing to get married and then you could have had all the comforts that all of us don't have so it's like you had that out which was it the you know i'm not saying that that was like the right choice but it was an interesting way to address this idea of like you know you could have settled you know you had that option and sure she never once considered it as a possibility <laughs> so an interesting I little think reuniting there. Lots of things have gone awry to make Rin's life as awful as it has become, uh, not the least of which her own choices, but also just the fact that this happened to her while a war was about to break out. Right. I mean, there's another version 
of Rin's story where maybe she does it during a more peaceful time and basically gets herself way like so much upward mobility that she never could have had otherwise by getting to Synagard. It's just True. gone. And I guess she's still got that upward mobility, but her life has sucked. So, but just about everyone's life is sucking right now in right. Uh, Nakar, like the Nakar empire That's because fair. of how crappy their situation is with all the war. But I don't know. I think she, she I think she had to do what she had to do. To get oh to yeah, her. like I don't, I don't question her choices, but it's an interesting yeah. perspective where she, where Rin, you could tell, still had feelings of like, like you were trying to sell me off. How could you do that to me? And she was like, "What are you talking about? Like, you were gonna live a better life than I had. You know, if you had married this guy, you would have been more comfortable than me. I did." the best I could for you, which is an interesting perspective. We don't typically look back on Auntie Fang as someone that we like, but um, she I was... I still don't, Charles. <laughs> I, I mean, she was being more realistic about these things. She should have. She could have been a little more supportive <laughs> so of the Synagard. She could have been a little more supportive of the Synagard thing, uh, but uh, she could have had faith in Rin that she would do well. She could have not been a drug dealer, but you know what? at least she did that one thing, right? Where she was like, I was, you know, you were going to live a better life than uh, the rest of us. But again, not like, and then Kasigi's like, hey, like you left me. How could you do that? And she's like, honestly, I don't really care about you that much. Sorry. <laughs> like I'm worried about my own stuff and like we aren't really family. So she, you can tell she kind of, cares but it's she just... realized that she never thought about him for a long time and she is kind True. of upset by that but she was being she was being she's like if i'm being totally honest i never like once i left i never looked back mm -hmm. and he was like you left me behind like your choice to improve yourself screwed me so yeah and that was kind of interesting well, it's an well, it's interesting because like, this they also ran starts into to... each other. Also, it was like really coincidental. I was like, "What is this? Like, that all these people, all these refugees, and now we're like running into each other here." And I don't know. She may have gone. Eh. Did she go looking for them? I can't yes, remember. She was yeah. looking. Well, she was looking actually for Tudor Feyric, and I, she does oh, not right, find right, Tudor right, Feyric, right, right. and then she comes across Auntie Fang and Kasegi instead. Okay. Uh, I mean. I don't know. Is it that? No, it's fine. It's a book. It wasn't even you know? like, <laughs> like a huge, like important moment either. It was just interesting to see them again. It's, it starts to set the foundation here, Charles, for her decision to try to be the champion of the South. That's fair. Yeah, for sure. Because it's Kasigi who helps, who tries to get her to join the Rooster Province to defect before the last battle on the Republic capital. Yeah. And she was like, no. <laughs> One, it's just a bad idea. And two, what have you guys ever done for me? I owe no allegiance to you. So she does eventually join the Rooster Republic, right, and join the South. But in that moment, she wasn't quite ready. She hadn't been, uh, she hadn't gone through what she went through in this last couple pages of the book here that we're on. <laughs> With this, with this last battle, so she refuses to join the Rooster Republic and defect, and she goes into battle she, armed with her flying suit. Um, oh, Charles, we didn't talk about Neja being a. a shot I was literally about to to get there, but and, that's way back. Yeah, it's way right? back, but here is there's a defining moment before the battle starts, kind of where she's like, "You could end all this by embracing the power, the shamanic powers." And he was like, I don't want it. And then there's this interesting moment where Rin kind of hates him for like, like, because she never considered that to be an option, like not take the power and live independently. Like that's an option that you can have and that you can live a full, successful, uh, privileged life with. You know, she kind of gets upset by that. And I thought that was an interesting reaction to her conversation with Neja there. She calls him a coward at one point for not using it. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
their relationship is one of the cores of this book. I don't know if we've done it that much justice by <laughs> not yet. Uh, We're already not talking pretty that much about it. Time, so we'll do our best yeah. to cover it quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think just important to know because they're kind of like they're training together. You're getting a ton of their interactions throughout, and it's very clear that the two of them have some sort of special bond Mm -hmm. that they care a lot about each other, but they're also very, I don't know if suspicious is the right word, uh, but uh, there's, uh, there's tension there that has been there since they first met. So they have this kind of love hate relationship. It's touched on, pretty directly in the text, right? She either wants to hit him or kiss him every time right. she sees him. Right. Like and there's that. that interesting, I, oh, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, I think, where um, Neja's like, how come we were such enemies? How come you hated me so much? And Rin makes this very valid observation where she's like, "You, when you were picking fights with me, I had no other option. I had no home to go back to. I was at a huge disadvantage. This was my everything. I was all invested in this. I couldn't afford to lose any of it. And you come from a place of privilege and of power. And this was just kind of a game to you. And that's the difference. And he was like, I never considered that. I always just thought you were mean. (laughs) Like, so it's, um, it's interesting how he didn't get that perspective until they had this heart to heart conversation. Right, and it's such a good portrayal of privilege from how Kwong portrays Neja, mm-hmm. where oftentimes it's just that you see the world only through the lens with which you've grown up with. Right, yeah, I took it for granted. Kind Neja, of. yeah, took for granted, hey, my life has always come with this safety net of being uh, the son of a really powerful lord of a province and it's just hard for him to truly step out of his shoes for a second and understand hey if i'm rin coming here with no safety net whatsoever then this is this isn't like some silly rivalry where we're mean to each other this is risking everything for me and i'm suffering consequences that you don't even have to consider because of who you are. Right. And that was a great moment. And that adds a really nice layer to their relationship. I feel like there were so many moments when they were together. There was one moment where Rin was like, and I knew that everything had changed forever. And, you know, it really didn't. <laughs> they, so it was like that, that happened a couple times um, in their conversations. I just thought it was super interesting that Rin was, because I forget what Neja said exactly, but it was about, shaman like using like shamanism and and something like that and he said and he was i think he maybe called out alton or something like that Um, yeah i think he said something racist about her being a spearly yeah spearly yeah so yeah Yeah. and then she was like that was it like we never the same and then they still had that moment at the end of the book where they were like drinking together and she wanted to you know she was still uh, had romantic feelings for him and things like that um, which I thought was fine. You know, that's young, like trying to deal with young love and not really fully understanding it. I was I was on board with it. You know, it was interesting. But I always liked that, how different their backgrounds were, their upbringings were, and how that plays a part in their relationship. And I think Kwong does a really interesting job of using their perspectives when it comes to the dialogue that they have. And it came to a head at that one moment where Neza just couldn't understand why Rin didn't like him at times. And it's like, you never once uh, had any empathy towards me, really, this whole time. Like, you couldn't think of how I came up and what my perspective was. And he was like, no, I never even thought about that. (laughs) I'm sorry. So it was just a fun moment that leads us to this war, right? Not much that we need to say about the war itself, Um, that we hadn't kind of covered already. I really just want to get to after the war, after that meeting with Daji um, and the betrayal uh, of Neja, right? This big moment. Yep. This moment is huge. And I have feelings about it. 
honestly. Um, I want to push back a little bit here. This is, I, I warned you coming in that I was going to push a little, little bit. And as much as I love this moment and as this betrayal, I mean, I saw it coming a mile away. Miles and miles and miles away. And I know er, there's many moments throughout this that we already talked about where Rin was like, hey, as long as I don't have to decide or or as long as this or that and her potential romantic entanglement with Neja and all these things. But still, it's like the minute she's like, this is the day I'm going to escape. And then it's like, hey, let's go for drinks. Already I was like, did he poison the drinks? Like, what's going on? Like, he's definitely going to betray her. And I, and I was definitely on high alert in those moments because like how many times did we have to get warned? Like she gets warned even that day before by the guy that she kills for the um for the for the leader of the republic right he she kills the betrayer she like pulls his heart out and kills him and he's like you know he's gonna betray you and she's like yeah i know i'm already making plans basically and even i want to go back to this one scene that i thought that i highlighted they're eating this is way way back where she's still in the good graces with neja and they're eating um like she's showing them around, I think, and they're eating Wawa fish. Do you remember this when they eat Wawa fish? I do. Remember and that, like yeah. they're, they're like, why are they called Wawa fish? It's like, well, because when you cook them, you like boil them alive and they scream or something like that. And and then they're just like, aren't they hilarious? Nezha picked a slice and put it in her bowl. Try it. Father loves them. Where it's like, okay, I take that as an obvious kind of. I mean, this one is it's minor, but I always thought it was funny how it's like, yeah, the. He revels in the pain of these fish as being like an ominous because she ends a chapter with that. Right. It's like makes you think like, oh, he re-, you know, he's it's like, isn't it funny how they're crying in pain? Ha ha. And that's an early warning. And then she's warned a bunch of times by Dodgy, by um, the commander that she killed, the warlord that she kills. She's even plotting to escape. And she still right. Gets entangled in this betrayal I, I saw it coming from too far away to fully buy in that this was as surprising for Rin as it should have been you know I feel like Rin should have been a little more and even she even said that our relationship was irreparably changed not too long ago from when Neja had those racist comments and then she kind of reverts back to all of it I just you know the temptation was there and I get it but I didn't fully buy into it and that's my little little pushback it's a great moment but i was like come on <laughs> like, i wasn't surprised were you surprised by this betrayal uh i was not shocked by it mm-hmm. there's also a line where right before neja asks why do you always think someone's trying to kill you and Rin says, why wouldn't I? Yeah. Literally, literally, that's like right before he stabs her. I I think that, I don't know, it was on my radar that this was very possible, right? And I, I just have a little bit of a different take on it, mm-hmm. I think, than you, Charles. And I think your your point is very valid. And if you need this to be a a, a twist or something for it to be as enjoyable for you like that's fair you know it's all i'm not saying i needed to be a twist anyway. i'm just saying rin as someone who her whole character is that she trusts no one and she's plotting an escape like the fact that she herself rin's character right like there is the plausible thing of rin falling for this and i get that i just for me i feel like she it's something she could have seen coming for me it wasn't like as obvious of a thing that she should have fallen for you know she even knew she's like oh i gotta get out of here i gotta escape you know this is a tempting thing but she's like "Ah, i just kind of want to feel that connection like really really you want to stop and have drinks you crazy (laughs) so it's you know but i get it i just had a little pushback no i feel i i also felt like it was a bit of a push that there's a lot of justification given as to why she has to have drinks because if she didn't, then he would suspect something. But that, but that's kind of true. Like they obviously did suspect all this stuff and it obviously, you know, they put Daji and uh, Suni, I think on night watch, like they were taking all these precautions where I don't know. I don't know how much it mattered whether Rin 
did or didn't know was coming to some extent if she wanted to escape with all the psych. Eh. And I think... And Charles, Rin isn't in a, a book in her head. She's not like, wow, this scene with the Wawa fish is total foreshadowing. No, I like, get it. Know. I get it. I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying... Like, I, I'm saying there's justification for it. My whole thing was... Rin is even saying, "Don't. Tr- why would I trust anybody?" You know, right before she gets stabbed. So, so here's here's where part of where I'm going is, Rin is what like twenty at this time. She's barely past being a teenager, uh, I think, if I'm correct about her age. But she's she's young. This is her, what feels like her first potentially requited experience of romantic feelings for someone and i think that's important she is drunk at the time maybe you're saying she shouldn't have even gotten drunk or whatever but it and i don't know on top of all that from just like a an enjoyment perspective for me i feel like it, like what you're saying raises interesting questions about how much does something benefit from being a surprise and how much does something benefit from being almost this inevitable tragedy that you're watching play out? It's like, I don't want to spoil Shakespeare for anyone, but I think like we all know what's coming at the end of Romeo and Juliet because of things. Yeah. It's a tragedy. And knowing that in some ways makes it even like, better in terms of quality art and enjoyable to watch because you kind of watch this thing play out and it's like oh it's so hard to watch i don't know how much it was no, that's to be a good twist. point and i'm not saying that it needed to surprise me as the reader like i can see it coming and it still happens and i'm totally fine with that it, for me it was it, it caught rin so off guard i, I guess i kind of had believed more in Rin but you can justify one she's young and she's kind of romantically involved and she's so desperate for she just wanted to feel normal and feel like she had friends and be in a community for a night you know and so all that stuff is there and I get it I just think there was so much at stake that I would suspect that someone who was willing to bomb a whole country would say no to drinks you know so and yes she was kind of forced to accept the invitation to avoid suspicion but she could have also just knocked Neza out and escaped you know so there were options that she had and and I'm not saying that this was something that was bad I'm just I had a little like a little pushback on it I still think it's great and I like the twist and I think the fact that it happened is what pushed Rin over the edge and like you said it is this just Shakespearean to watch the inevitable happen is and be tragic is great and i think that's a lot of what happens here i just like it kind of goes against rin's character a little a little bit a little bit a little bit (laughs) i mean it's it's fair to feel still a great book still a great moment on the the ftf podcast (laughs) on the ftf podcast we always honor that people's experiences of the book are allowed to be whatever what they are. What do you I think, mean, listener? As <laughs> I, oh, me, I know what you listeners. think already. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get our, our engagement up. Let's see what the fans have to say. Yeah, well, if they contact us on social media, they're going to be interacting with me. It's not you, Charles. <laughs> I can still read it and respond if I want to. I have the Theoretically. <laughs> Rarely, rarely happens, but theoretically. Theoretically. Yep. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Let's, <laughs> I'm glad you stopped directing them to a comment section that doesn't exist, though. That's uh, <laughs> one of the earlier <laughs> episodes, I think, has you doing that. You can still write in the comments. <laughs> We're on YouTube. A little Tec- bit. <laughs> Technically. Barely. <laughs> barely. <laughs> Um, All right. So, yeah, um, great moment. Great book. And then we get to the end, which we talked about, you know, Rin's... Rin's uh, transition to a res- role of responsibility of leadership. She accepts the the leadership role of the South. Great moment. Super happy she For got sure. there. I got chills with that last line. Mm-hmm. So it's where 
I think Kid A says, then we'll go to war against the strongest military force in the world. And Rin says, they're not the strongest military force in the world. And she slams her fist against the table. I am. Right. <laughs> and like, I think it's like, they, that's pretty awesome. And I think she said it to, with the Phoenix, right? Like, the Phoenix, like the yeah. The Phoenix was they, also like, I am the strongest force. So, yeah, great moment there. Fun, like, one of those moments where you're super happy, but like you had brought up, it's like, we're happy for character development, but now there's this new piece on the on the table that's super violent wild card talking about extending a war and human suffering. Yeah, it's so strange to balance that that ambivalence that comes up around this where you're you're happy to see the growth of Rin kind of from being in her perspective and to see her out from all these shadows she's been under with people like Vizra and Alton. Right. but also scared for what the future might hold with Rin, this assured with herself as a leader, willing to throw whatever it takes to get what she wants. Agreed. 100%. Really happy with the ending of this book, and it makes me really excited to pick up book three when it comes out. Yeah, I'm pumped for The Burning God. Uh yeah. I mean, and we've seen now uh, from Guang how well she can deliver with a sequel. So That's right. I mean, I'm excited. And it is a trilogy, so this story is comes the to end. An end. Yeah. yeah. So. This is the end. And I mean, it's amazing she's even been able to tell this much more story after how much she told in that first book. Right. So, right. Uh, I'm excited to see where it goes next. Yes, me as well, dude. Um, is there anything else you wanted to bring up before we brought this to a head? Mm, nothing comes to mind right now, Charles. All hey, right. Tell them where they can contact us. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's not as fun with that little outro music in the background. So let's get True. that going. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening to another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. This has been uh, your host, Charles, along with my co-host, Dylan, and uh, we could not be happier to have discussed the Dragon Republic with you today. So if you had thoughts, tell us more about Neza's portrayal, let us know. Go ahead and... Uh, find us on social media at the FTF Podcast. We're also on Twitter at the FTF Podcast with the number one at the end. You could also send us an email at uh, the FTF Podcast at gmail.com. So go ahead and find us there. Rate five stars, all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nailed it. Nailed it. Nothing more to say. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends.